Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, Chapter 11, Part 1, Muscle Movement Mechanics. Now, we think of the generic kind of muscle, we think of it being attached in two places to two different bones. The first place of attachment is referred to as the origin, and the origin is located on the bone that does not move when the muscle contracts. The second side of attachment is called the insertion, and it is located usually on an adjacent bone, but it almost always has to cross over a joint, and it is the second muscle uh, bone that will move when the muscle contracts. And as you can see in the picture here, we give an example of the biceps brachii. Now, it's worth pointing out that some muscles can cross over more than one joint, which means potentially they could cause one joint to engage in our movement, the other joint to engage in movement, or even both joints. Also, some muscles are capable of what's called a reverse muscle action. What this means is basically the muscle in certain cases can flip what is the origin and the insertion, thereby moving the bone that normally we think of as not moving during a muscle contraction. Also, it's worth pointing out that muscles can also attach to skin, and even in some cases other muscles. Um, but primarily when we think of muscle and muscle movements, we're thinking of muscles that are moving bones across a joint. So basically, when muscles are moving bones, they're acting as a lever. And I'm sure you remember all about the physics of levers back when you took physics or physical science. But let's go over a few points that you may have forgotten over time. To start with, the fixed point at which the lever is going to move is what we called the fulcrum. So in this case, the fulcrum is the elbow joint itself. Then there's the levers. The levers are the rigid bars, which in our case are going to be the bones that the muscle is attached to. And then the load is whatever is being moved. So in this, this case, it's the block that's in the hand, plus the weight of the arm, but primarily the block that's in the hand. That is the load. And then there's the effort. The effort is the force that is in the opposing direction of the load. So as you can see here, the load is being pulled down by the weight of gravity. So the effort to hold it up by the muscle is referred to as the effort. And this is caused by the muscle contracting and generating that force. Now there are two big categories of levers. There are levers that give you a mechanical advantage. And in a mechanical advantage, the load is closer to the fulcrum than the effort. And this will therefore require less overall effort. So with a mechanical advantage, it's easier to move your load, and this is because the load is closer to the fulcrum than the effort. On the other hand, you have the mechanical disadvantage. Here, the load is farther from the fulcrum than the effort, which means that you're going to need even more force or effort to move that load. It seems like you wouldn't really want to do that, but it is common in some levers systems for there to be a mechanical disadvantage requiring more work necessary to move the object than you would expect. So here, for example, is a lever system with the E for effort, L for load, and F for fulcrum. So is this an advantage or a disadvantage? Well, it turns out this is a mechanical advantage because the fulcrum, represented by the triangle, is closer to the load than it is to the effort. And if we used math, you can see that if you had 100 kilogram load, that's one meter from the fulcrum, then all you need is some an effort that's slightly greater than 50 kilograms of force if that end of the uh, lever is two meters away. Don't worry, we're not doing any math in this class, but some people can appreciate this better seeing numbers. All right, well, it turns out there are three types of levers. Uh, that we traditionally think about. There's the first class levers, and in the first class levers, the fulcrum is between the effort and the load. So examples is the seesaw that you saw earlier. Another example would be how scissors work. The fulcrum is in between where the effort and the load is. And in the human body, an example of a first class lever is the 
um, using the muscle semispinalis capitis, you're able to move the head back and forth um, with the head being the load, the uh, occipital um, atlantic joint being the uh, fulcrum, and the um, muscle being the effort. A second class lever, the load is between the fulcrum and the effort. So this is an example you could see in a wheelbarrow. So with the wheel being the fulcrum, the effort being where you lift up, and the weight of the load in the barrel being where the load is. An example in the human body is the gastronomous uh, muscle that's found in the lower leg. So the fulcrum is the ball of the foot, the load is the tibia where the weight of the body is, and then the uh, gastronomous muscle is where the effort is. And then there's the third class lever, which is actually the most common in the human body. And it is where the effort is between the fulcrum and the load. And examples of that would be tweezers, trying to pick something up with tweezers. Or what I think is a little better example is going fishing, where the fulcrum is where you're holding the end of the rod. The effort is you pulling on the rod, and then the load is the fish. And one of many examples in the human body is the biceps brachii, where the fulcrum is the elbow, the effort is where the biceps brachii is located, and the load is what's in your hand. So, for these different classes of levers, do you see a mechanical advantage or disadvantage? Well, it turns out that with the first class lever, it varies. It just depends on where the fulcrum is in relation to the effort and the load. So, depending on if it's closer to the effort or closer to the load, it could be one or the other. The second class lever is always a mechanical advantage. Because the load is in between the fulcrum and the effort, you're always going to get an advantage. And then the third class lever is always a mechanical disadvantage. Because the effort is now between the fulcrum and the load. And this is kind of strange because, as I said, the most common kind of lever in the human body is the um, third class lever. So why is it that we have uh, the levers that are providing mechanical disadvantages? Well, it's because it allows for greater speed and range of motion when we do use that kind of lever. So basically that flexibility is more important than the fact that we have to put extra work into moving something. All right, now to a transition to a new topic, the arrangement of fascicles within muscles. So as you remember, fascicles are bundles of muscle fibers surrounded by connective tissue that are found within the belly of a muscle organ. So fascicles can be in many different patterns with respect to the tendon, and I'll be going over those. The very first kind that the book talks about is parallel. Here, the fascicles all run parallel to each other, and they terminate in the end and flat tendons. They look pretty much like an uh, almost uniformly sized strip. Then there's the fusiform. They also are parallel in terms of the vesicles and how they flow, but the muscles tend to taper toward the tendon, so you get more of that bulgy area in the middle. That's kind of what we traditionally think of as a muscle, so it's just the biceps sprachii. There are also circular uh, arrangements of the fascicles where they basically form concentric circles and this is basically referred to as a sphincter muscle because when the muscles contract they sort of close an orifice so an example would be uh, closing your eye you have a circular arrangement of fascicles in that muscle then there's triangular where the fascicles are spread out over a very broad area but then they converge down into a tendon and they look, well, kind of like the shape of a triangle. There's the pinnate, where you have short fascicles in terms of relative, le relative length of the muscle, so they don't actually run the entire length themselves. Instead, it's the tendon that actually runs most or all of the length of the muscle. And you can have pinnates that are unipinnate, which means uh, they're pretty much all coming off of one side of a tendon. They can be pi bipinnate, which means they're coming off both sides of a tendon looks kind of like a feather. And then there's multipinnate, where you have multiple tendons shooting out, so you end up uh, with basically a bunch of little feathers-like structures connected at one big tendon. 
Muscle names. Well, if you look at table 11.2 in your textbook, it goes over specific names of all kinds of, uh, of how you name the muscles. But a key thing to remember is when you're looking at the names of muscles, there's often information hidden there that can help you in identifying the muscle, where it's located, what it does. Um, so you want to look for things like one, like if the name of the location is in there. Biceps brachii, brachii, the upper arm. If it's the shape, such as the deltoid, triangular, relative size, longus, maximus, um, brevis, uh, the direction of the fascicles and muscle fibers relative to the midline, you've got oblique and rectus, uh, the location of the attachments, uh, such as the um, genohyoid is an example, the number of origins, uh, biceps brachii, triceps brachii, and, and the action, if it's a flexor, a pronator, that sort of thing. So be sure to look over those terms and use them to help you in understanding the muscle through its name. Finally, uh, it's important to m point out that uh, muscles don't operate all by themselves. They tend to work in groups. The most common arrangement is where you've got opposed pairs where one muscle is contracting, and that's referred to as the prime mover or the agonist. In this case, our example, the biceps brachii could be the prime mover. And the other muscle, usually often on the other side of the bone, is stretching or relaxing, and that's the antagonist. So in this case, that would be the triceps brachii. So like I said, you often get a pairing of opposing muscles. However, Again, there are many muscles in areas helping with different movements and helping with the same movement. So other muscles can come into play at the same time. So that you can have what are called synergists, which basically help in the movement by the prime mover or the stretching by the antagonist and help basically make sure that that movement is going in a more coordinated uh, manner. And then you also have fixators, which are very important, especially if the prime mover has multiple joints uh, that it crosses so that the fixator will make sure that the joint that you want to not have any movement at does not move. Fixator keeps that fixed or locked in position. So in this case, if you're uh, moving your forearm, you don't want to move the shoulder, so you've got fixators that are going to keep the shoulder from moving while the biceps brachii is flexing. And that's it for Part 1 of Chapter 11.